All right. Um, I want to welcome everybody to Midcoast Friends Meeting House for this uh, presentation today uh, on a trip that three of my friends uh, took to the Alberta tar sands. So uh, in 1953, which is about 60 years ago, uh, Felix Cohen, who actually authored the original handbook of the Indian law, and he played a major role in the Indian New Deal, which is also known as the Indian Reorganization Act. He wrote that like the miner's canary, the Indians marks the shifts from fresh air to poisonous gas in our political atmosphere. And I think today around the world, we all read every day about how indigenous peoples and their sacred lands are under attack as corporations lay claim to those lands, undermining treaties and land rights. There, there the industries mine, drill, clear cut, and destroy ecosystems and ancient cultures to feed profits, and all of this fueled by our own thirst for fossil fuels and other resources that support a consumptive way of life. Indians are indeed the canaries who provide a warning that attacks on Indian self-determination as a sign of danger to everyone's freedom. And only last week that was pointed out as the US House voted to go forward with the Keystone XL pipeline. And in response to that, the Rosebud, Rosebud Sioux Tribe President Cyril Scott remarked uh, that Congress's action is an act of war against a sovereign nation. The tribe has yet to be consulted by the US State Department about building that pipeline across their sovereign lands. At the same time, the Canadian corporation, TransCanada, which is committed to get tar sands from Alberta, where it's landlocked, out to global markets, they have hired a PR company that is determined to lobby and forge ahead with pipelines, trains, barges, any way possible to get that, the product to market. This, again, is to cross First Nation lands and communities in Canada. What ties all these stories to us here in Maine? And that's why my friends are here to speak to us. Last summer, they traveled a very long ways, and I know they're going to tell you about it, to Alberta to find out the facts and also to join in a spiritual exercise of a healing walk with First Nation people. The three are here to share pictures and stories from that unbelievable experience. I want to just briefly introduce them to you. Uh, Lee Chisholm of Freeport is, was a practicing attorney in Portland for 15 years before he became a Waldorf school class teacher. And today, he teaches science, math, history, and geography at the Friends School of Portland. He's a nonviolence trainer for the Keystone Pledge of Resistance, and he is a committed member of 350 Maine. Uh, Hillary Clark of York is a lifelong environmental activist. She currently coordinates for 350 Maine York region and is a member of the York Energy Steering Committee. She's president of the York Land Trust. She's a convener of the South Church Unitarian Universalist Green Sanctuary Group, and she's a member of Population Matters Maine. And Sarah Lachance, uh, Cape Porpoise, so these guys have traveled a distance to come share today with us. 
she started a um, campaign earth in 2000, an organization to educate the public about climate change. She currently volunteers as 350 Maine's Tar Sands Team Co-Coordinator, and her passion is educating everybody about the enormous environmental harm and social injustices that result from tar sands extraction. So please join me in welcoming Lee and Sarah and Hillary. Thanks. Hi. Um, Welcome. I'm glad to see you all here. Um, I wanted to start by just sharing, having each of us share why we went all the way to Alberta. Um, it was a very long way. It used a lot of fossil fuels, which is what we were saying we don't want to be using, and yet we did. And for me, it was because it's important to me to acknowledge, to experience what the repercussions of my actions are and seeing where the fossil fuels come from was important to me. It was important to me to be part of looking towards the healing, and I thought the First Nations people would have something to give me in that. And also, um, I'm friends with a lot of very conservative people, and one of the people said to me that the Keystone XL pipeline would not hurt the environment, and that it would just make us energy independent, and that it would um, provide jobs. And I needed to see for myself um, so that I could then share with people who feel so passionately that it is okay, that it wasn't okay. Um, so again, Sarah Lachance, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Andy, for organizing. Um, the reason I went up there is all for the same reasons that Hillary uh, just shared with you. And also, um, I find myself talking, I have two children, 11 and 13. And so I often go and share the stories in classroom settings and talk to the children. And it's always a very startling moment um, for me when I start telling them about these treaty rights being broken because the kids are like, well, wait a second. We learn about that in the history books. We learned how terrible that was that we did that. That's the history. That's not the present. And they're so, they, they actually think I'm lying to them. They can't believe that this is, could actually be, be going on because what they're taught in the history books presents it as if we have learned better. Uh, but of course, we all know the truth that that's not actually what's happening. Um, so that was a big part of why I went up there to, to bear witness to that, to take the, the photographs. And um, this past winter, all of us here in 350 um, organized a tour where we brought folks from that area to come and share the story firsthand. And um, Ariel Deranger and Crystal Lehman asked me to join them on the healing walk um, this year so that I could go and be a part of that. Thank you for organizing this. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm going to be very quick. Uh, I think I principally went up because uh, I consider that area of North America sort of the burning fuse of the climate crisis, probably more than any other location on this continent. I also wanted to experience the Native American, the First Nation tribes up there. It almost flipped for me. What I saw and experienced of their experience became primary. Uh, seeing the burning fuse of the climate crisis, a very close secondary. What we really want to do is to talk to your heart today, but we'll also be speaking to your mind to give you some facts and figures. Um, but it was really an emotional experience being up there. Um, so we want to share about the First Nation communities, where they are, um, their traditional ways of life. We want to talk about Fort McMurray, where we flew into, which is kind of the center for the oil boom town, and tell you a little bit about tar sands oil, because we're not sure how much people know about that. And then we want to share our experience on the healing walk, and then what we can do um, to change the future. So just to ground us all in the area that we're speaking of, um, this slide helps you all look at um, Alberta. And where the red arrow points is obviously sort of Fort McMurray, which is ground zero, so to speak, uh, for tar sands extraction. Um, this is an area that 
uh, up until about a decade ago, the extraction process has been taking place for 40 or 50 years. They've been developing um, the way to get tar sands out of the earth. But it didn't really start taking hold um, until, quite frankly, 9-11 was a pivotal moment um, when uh, there was a shift because people recognized there'd be such a thirst for oil coming from secure nations that people would tolerate the environmental destruction that was coming um, from this project based on um, what had just taken place on 9-11. Uh, up until that point, 10 or 12 years ago, um, to access most of these First Nation communities, you're talking about um, very rudimentary dirt roads, um, footpaths still throughout their community. And the Athabasca Chippewyan in the wintertime, they actually get around even to the big cities to just leave their community by the frozen rivers. They drive across the rivers on their snowmobiles and their trucks. So this is places that are incredibly pristine, incredibly remote, where the First Nations way of life for the, that has been existing, you know, for as long as we can remember the beginning of time was still very much intact. This map, it shows where Fort McMurray is, and then the river flows north, and that's the Athabasca. Um, so just wanted to show you where that watershed was. Yeah, really quickly, this is the arrow that points toward Fort McMurray. These mountains, the Canadian Rockies, it comes out and flows to that lake. Very briefly, I just wanted to, to note that even before the First Nations got there, geologically, this is an amazing area. The oil wouldn't be there in the first place had there not been a sea that covered it. And after the sea left, the dinosaur world in the Jurassic period uh, entered it even before there were flowering plants, just conifers and giant tree-like club mosses and ponds and so on. And in the mining, they find dinosaur remains. So it's sort of, from a geologist's point of view, uh, it's an interesting place. And then also to realize how remote it is, um, the Rand McNally, I think people here know what Rand McNally maps are. You don't all use GPS. Well, they didn't stop. They didn't go as far as, far as Fort McMurray because there's one road. Um, so you didn't need to have a, a, a map to, to see that. Uh, a quick uh, broad brush history of Fort McMurray. Uh, back in the 1800s, it was a, a sort of a secondary trading post to Fort Chippewyan on Lake Athabasca. Uh, Fort McMurray, I think, had first become a, a trading post of some significance by the uh, uh, voyagers of the Hudson Bay Company. But that was the economic life, a thriving native population trading furs and other goods with uh, folks uh, selling the furs in Europe. The tar sands, all, every person living in the area knew of, the natives would use the tar sands to seal uh, their canoes. You can kind of heat the stuff and it will rise up out of the, it will become a kind of a, a froth when mixed with water and you can kind of lift it off and it's got a molasses-like consistency and it was very nice with the canoes. In the 1920s, a scientist figured out a way to uh, extract the stuff technologically and patented it, but economically it wasn't feasible until uh, pioneering Canadian company since known as Suncor in the 60s uh, took off on tar sands. So around the time that the Beatles were cutting their first albums, the tar in the early 60s, the uh, tar sands mining began and Fort McMurray was a town of about a thousand in those early days. By the 70s it had grown to 10,000. By the 80s and 90s it had grown to 30,000. And as Sarah said, it has just been taking off. So now it's a town of 70-odd thousand with an additional 40,000 guest workers. The economy is booming. And if you can picture a big city, bigger than Maine's biggest city, uh, that's no older than 30 years, essentially, you have a good picture of Fort McMurray. It's kind of the gold rush town of the early 21st century. Average incomes for 85% of the people are $100,000. For 25% of the people, it's over $200,000. I've heard of retirement plans of folks who kind of come in and said, well, we don't particularly relish working here, but 
five good years, she makes $200,000 a year, I make $200,000 a year, this will be our five-year plan, then we'll retire. Though often the five years turns into 10 years and so on. So we saw evidence of money, but it was kind of hard hat, uh, big, big truck money, not Mercedes Benz, not Wall Street look. It's kind of, you know, it was hard hats and dungarees and work boots and, and, and people from all corners of the globe meeting in the, in the motel uh, breakfast room to kind of plot out their day and head off on, on trucks for the working day. Booming and uh, thriving. I think most of you have probably seen pictures like this. Uh, this is the open pit mining up near the area uh, where we were. It was just over the horizon from the walk, so we did not actually behold this, but we saw, could see the sunlight glinting off the trucks on the you know, edge of the horizon where this was going on. The truck in the middle there is about three stories high, uh, 400 tons, the biggest heavy hauler ever made. And these, this, this tar sands industry is the biggest industrial complex in the world right now. Bill McKibben, uh, the 350.org founder, aptly characterized his experience of this area of the world as Mordor. For those of you who have read Lord of the Rings, he characterized it as Mordor, the black place. And when we come to talking about the tailing ponds and the way they're protecting wildlife with the tailing ponds, you've got to hear the sound of guns, cannons going off every 10, 20 seconds to kind of give you the, the, the sound effect as well as the visual for mortar. Briefly, the tar sands mining process, this is the, the worst oil. It's just, if you, if, you, if you were changing the oil in your car, you had a sandy driveway and you got it in the sand, it's about like that. It is it is ugly stuff. Quartz crystals, so it chews up steel very, quartz sand, so it chews up steel very well. But they have gone at this with every intellectual, scientific, technological resource at a 21st century person's command, and uh, it's formidable. It is awe-inspiring. It is awesome. So these huge trucks scoop it up. They're working 24 hours a day, by the way. There's no rest. Scoop it up send it on to grinders and these great grinding wheels kind of break down the rock into a, 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 as, as fine a sand as they can get. And then they heat it. And the heating process separates the bitumen, the, the tar sands oil itself, from the clay, slan, sand, water, slurry. And they centrifuge that off, kind of like a, a washing machine, only in vast industrial sized centrifuges. And that stuff, that tailing stuff, goes into a pond. There are many of these ponds, these tailing ponds now. So toxic that birds can't land on them but what they die. Thus the cannons along the shore to warn animal life away. We pass these, you'll see pictures of them more perhaps a little bit later. Uh, they take the bitumen then and they have to uh, uh, crack it. In effect, it's, it's these long hydrocarbon chains, and in these big towers, they kind of heat it and break it apart, uh, pulling out of it a, a, a raw form of carbon called pet coke, petroleum coke, which ironically the Koch brothers send all around the world. It's the dirty stuff, but can be mixed with coal to make electricity, so they, the Koch brothers store the pet coke byproduct of this in uh, Detroit and Chicago and other parts in the US before shipping it away. Uh, but meanwhile, with the rest of the cracking, they add hydrogen, they're trying to kind of make of this molasses, heavy carbon stuff, a usable oil. And they separate out uh, naphtha and gas oils and kerosene and then kind of mix them back in, putting them in great tanks, which you will see pictures of. And from there, uh, it's ready to ship. It is a massive, unbelievably uh, brilliant, with a very cold, light, brilliant uh, achievement that couldn't probably have been done as well 10, 20, 30 years as well uh, ago. I wanted to say, so as you can tell, it's very carbon intensive taking 
trying to extract this carbon. And I found it quite ironic when I read that they take some light crude from the Nebraskas or Dakotas, and they ship it up here in order to extract this heavier crude to bring it back down to Louisiana. So this next slide, just quickly, uh, more industry to look at, but um, we'll talk later about how much the Canadian government has sort of wiped clean a lot of the environmental regulations that what ex once existed in the country so that they can move forward with this level of destruction. And here's a clear example. You can see the tailing pond in the upper center here and how close it is to the Athabasca River. These tailing ponds are not required to have any covering underneath the bottom of it so they don't leak. They just dig a hole in the ground and plop the toxins in. Um, and they leak at an alarming rate into these rivers and are poisoning the communities downriver from them. Um, and the word pond, of course, needs to be eliminated because you can see these things from space. And I just wanted to share that it wasn't a tar sands oil tailing pond that had the breach in August. I don't know if people heard. It was a um, copper mining tailings pond. But, you know, we're told that this is safe, that the toxins will not leak into um, the rivers that are nearby. And they do, and they have. And um, they had to stop using that water because it became so toxic in British Columbia after the tailings mines leak in August. So we have arrived in... Um, Fort McMurray, and we stayed in a hotel, and then the um, First Nations people have land at Lake Gregoire, an Indian beach, and this was um, our first experience of the weekend there. Yeah, uh, Sarah and I said we, we both wanted to speak about an experience we had in this teepee. Uh, which fit about 50 or 60 of us, somewhere between 50 and 60. We began our uh, first morning in Fort McMurray with a, a, a First Nation pipe ceremony. And like many of you sitting here, I had had no idea, really, what a First Nation pipe ceremony would be. So briefly, I just want to walk you through it and give you a sense of what it was like for me. Uh, all of us were, were, were sort of uh, warmly welcomed into, went through that flap and sort of walked around the periphery of the teepee. Again, this is no small structure. It held 60 of us comfortably. We didn't fill the center. Uh, in the middle, on very green summery grass, a small fire had been built, and it was kind of whispering and singing and crackling, and the flames were very, very modest. At one end of the teepee uh, sat the chief with a blanket spread out before him and some sweet grass and cedar and sage and tobacco in separate kind of vessels and a two foot long plus uh, ceremonial pipe which had been handed down through time. Now a word about this chief, you know. Uh, their grandparents were sort of, you know, predated the real uh, impact of the European uh, North American in. I mean, it's, it's really close. The language lives. They speak the language. The old ways are there. The elders that perform the ceremonies are there. So we weren't seeing something uh, artificial. As we sat down, uh, four... Uh, native drummers stood up, maybe it was five, and they had these, these drums with skins spread taut on them, and at a nod from the chief, they began this drumming, and with the drumming, a chanting, and it was, it was, it was kind, it kind of ripped my skull open, you know, just the sound, I felt like I was stepping back in time to a North America far more ancient and, in a sense, far more wise as I walk, you know, they are the masters of sustainability. That's what we were beholding a little piece of. We have so much to learn from them. They're beating and chanting, and he, the chief, is, is mixing uh, what will be burnt, and he holds the pipe up first to one direction and in tones of prayer in the native language. 
and then on, on all four directions. Slowly, ritualistically, mindfully, like a, like a Zen teat ceremony or something. All the while the drums are going. And, and I'm feeling kind of a little bit lifted off the ground, beholding this, but watching it intently. And finally, to the above and the below, and then uh, somebody brings him a coal and he lights the pipe. And the drumming stops. Maybe the drumming stopped an instant before the pipe was lit. At that, the most sort of non-theatrical, human, simple, unassuming, but passing of the pipe took place. And everybody drew on the pipe. And the tobacco fumes, the fumes of these, of the sweet grass and so on, which was beautiful. The, the, the smell was wonderful. Think of your great grandfather's finest pipe tobacco and then, then uh, send it to another octave with sweet grass and cedar and so on. It's wonderful. This stuff wafted up and the, the, the intent palpably was to link uh, our physical soul world with the spirit world and to sort of seek a blessing on all of us here through the linking there. And Sarah's going to say something particular about that, I think, and she might want to share a little bit more. Thank you. Um, so Lee's painted a really nice picture. If you can imagine um, this pipe um, being sent around us, and we're about, we've all traveled from so many places around Canada and around the US um, to be there with this intention of going on this walk with these people. And the chief speaks of the prayer and what we're offering and what we're doing during that ceremony. And I'll never forget um, that moment where I really kind of had that feeling where I left my body and felt so connected to people that have come before me and the people that will come after me, and that's who we were um, sharing the pipe for. He asked us all to think about as the pipe was being passed around and the smoke was circling up through the teepee to, to stop and think about the spirits in waiting and all of the beings that are gonna come here after us. And they're all looking down on us and they're all wondering, are you paying attention? Mother Earth warriors, I see you in this, in this teepee gathered right now, gathered for us. You're standing up in solidarity to push back on what we're up against. And to, for us to keep those spirits in waiting in our hearts as we went on the walk and to think about what it's going to look like for a generation from now and two generations from now when they enter here. And it was as a mother um, and as a mother who hopes that her children can choose to have children in a place that is safe and sacred and where we honor everyone. It just, um, well, I can't speak to the power of it, but um, I hope I did some justice. So this is um, a photograph of where people camped out um, at our meeting area. And we had a day of workshops to uh, learn about the treaty rights that have been broken, about the effects of tar sands, about the pipelines that have been um, that are there are being proposed. And I want to hold on this slide for a little bit because this is what touched me so deeply was, well, I know when I was 19, I canoed the Yukon River. And I know that I could swim in that river and I could drink from that river and we could eat the fish that we caught from that river. And here I was in Northern Alberta and I should be able to do the same. But instead, I knew that this lake, if you swim in it, you're likely to develop rashes from swimming in it. If you, um, if you eat the fish, they can be more poison than not. That this water is not safe to drink, the air that we're breathing really isn't safe to breathe. And that broke my heart. Um, the, Workshop that I'd like to, or the speaker that I'd like to share um, most in depth with you about is Dr. John O'Connor, who was um, a man from Great Britain who first came as a family physician to Fort McMurray, and then he went down to Fort, one of the um, the native communities, Fort Chip, um, to become a family physician. And this 
um, was in the late 1990s, early 2000s, and he was starting to notice, he was listening to the native people talking about how things were changing. They couldn't, the muskrats were dying, which was a traditional food. The fish were deformed. They were smelling oil and some of the food that they were eating. Um, and then he was, and as a physician, he was seeing some very rare cancers. And um, people were developing leukemia at very high rates. And he mentioned this, he, so he sent word to um, the Department of Health in Canada, and he got no answer. This was in 2004. In 2006, there was a reporter who came and was looking at this, and he spoke to the reporter. And lo and behold, after that, he was sanctioned by the College of Physicians and Surgeons for causing undue alarm that he was told that he should not be speaking out, that there was no difference in cancer, that there was nothing wrong happening here. It took him two years to clear his name. He ended up, the community lost their family physician because it got so ugly. And this was, it was very hard for them to have a local doctor there, and they had found a good one, and they couldn't keep him because he was being attacked and he was being smeared. So in 2009, the College of Surgeons and Physicians said, oh, you're right. There is a higher cancer rate. It's 30% higher here in the beautiful northern part of our country. And so I, had been to, I went to Wikipedia, and they have on it that he was sanctioned for causing undue alarm, but nobody has corrected it to say that he was vindicated and that he was right. Um, and that was another lesson that I learned about where we get our information from. And another reason why it was so important to go here was to, um, to see firsthand what was happening. Um, so the next couple slides just show a couple of incredibly brave uh, women. But before I tell their individual stories, just again to th think about this region, um, the folks that are living up there, it's um, the Athabasca Chippewyan First Nation, the Fort McMurray First Nation, the Matisse, the Beaver Lake Cree, the Fort McKay Cree, uh, and a few others that I'm not recalling. But there's nine or ten First Nation communities that live up in this area that are um, directly affected by the tar sands extraction. And then there's all the other First Nation communities that, of course, will be affected as the pipeline communities. Pipelines get built, all the communities through there. So across the country, you have First Nation communities that have treated land that should never be used to extract oil that are losing their land and having their land poisoned. Um, this woman here, Ariel Deranger, uh, is an amazingly strong young woman and mother who has made the decision to no longer live with her Athabasca Chippewyan community because it's so toxic. Uh, she actually shares a story of her daughter, um, when they, they go back as often as they can and with their family and friends there, but her daughter said to her mom, she said, Mom, I don't ever wanna go back there and live because too many people, too many people we know are dying. So, her, and her daughter at that point was 11 years old and knew it wasn't a safe place for them to live. This woman, Crystal Lehman, is of the Beaver Lake Cree, another amazing um, young activist and mom she has chosen to stay in her community. And uh, like Hillary was just speaking about um, some of these really startling realities that we learned being up there that are so hard to wrap your head around that how is this still going on? When we went on the walk, when we were walking for hours and hours and I was so startled by the fact that the water trucks, there were all these water trucks flying by us on the highway and they were all honking the loudest and putting their arms out in solidarity thanking us for being there. The reason was because they're bringing water to the First Nation communities because the water is so poisoned that they are actually having water trucked in to their homes, into large cisterns every morning um, to drink. Now, there is still water that's coming out of the wells that is used some days for showering. Crystal told us this story that every morning someone tests the water, and depending on if there's been lots of rains or whatever, some days an alarm will go off in her community. If the alarm sounds, 
their toxic levels are so high in their water, don't bathe the children because the children come out of the water with rashes and first degree burns. Um, so this is some of the stuff that you hear that's just mind boggling to think that it's still taking place uh, and that um, nobody's stopping it. Um. Just wanted you to see that so we, we took a bus ride about um, 30 minutes, 40 minutes from where we camped to the start of the walk. And we went by the boreal forest. And this is the largest intact forest um, on Earth. And we really need these forests to continue to uh, produce oxygen for us. And I want you to see, you can see that the smog is starting to develop. As we get closer to the site, the air gets thicker and thicker. We can start to be able to smell it and to taste it. Um, but if you go on to any of the oil company sites, you never see anything other than beautiful blue sky. They've done a great job of photoshopping what it looks like up there. So this is sort of the beginning of the walk. Uh, just taking note here of, again, the intention that they always had to make this a true ceremonial, sacred experience. So uh, even though this was a press conference, which therefore doesn't feel that sacred, <laughs> but um, the recognition of making sure that they had an opportunity um, for men and women to speak, for the chiefs to speak, um, and share their story with the press, uh, you know, and also opened it up with a prayer during the press conference. But they recognize that even though this is a healing walk that was steeped in their traditions, it was also an opportunity to get their story out, so they wanted to have a chance to chat with the press. Um, it was made clear to us, this was the fifth and, and actual, actually final uh, healing walk up there. Uh, it had started five years ago by sort of the need to do something, but uh, the First Nations folks, we're not political, what can we do? And the elders very much wanting, we can, we can, we can heal. That's what we can do. We can do a prayerful walk. So this weekend we had was full of, of a prayer and ceremony that came quite naturally. As you could imagine, all the visitors were all over the spectrum for, for religious or non-religious background. But it came quite naturally. And what I experienced on the walk was really an absence of we, they. Not total, perhaps but is astoundingly close to total. They were, there were no enemies. They were acting for humanity, sort of, in, out of their traditions. And it was very powerful in that way. So this is, I would say at least 50% of us chose to wear masks on the walk. And 75% um, so of us chose to wear masks. <laughs> That's OK. Um, and I had heard about this kind of flu that people tended to, to have after the walk and just wanted to share that I did. I experienced incredible muscle pains for a couple days after I got back that I can only attribute to my body trying to work through those toxins. I'd like to point out the young woman on the right, Alex Binder, and she, um, had, she had just graduated from UNH and she went the whole route of one of the pipelines and talked to people along the way. I believe she's a budding journalist. Um, does anybody else want to talk about the beginning? It was frightening. It was scary. It was scary to, to choose to, to do this walk for worry about what that was going to be, what I was doing to myself. And I know that we had people who wanted to join us who didn't dare make the, the journey. Okay. So this was the beginning of the walk. Um, elder women. Um, were the ones that, that led us, and um, I don't know what else to say. It was just very powerful to be part of um, this mass of humanity that, were there a couple hundred? A couple hundred. Um, and how many First Nations versus others? Do you, is it maybe half and half, or 75% First Nations? And, um, and so those drummers, these drummers um, came, they took, 
came 18 hours from their community to be part of this. And I just wanted to, to just say about the, the drumming, to me it felt like it was, it was like a heartbeat and it was what we walked to. Um, it both united us, it united us as one, and you could, it was the heartbeat of our own heartbeats, but also the heartbeat of, of, of all life as we were walking. Um. So uh, another moment, uh, throughout the walk, which took us the entire day, um, we were a slow-moving group to the beat of the drums. And we stopped and had prayers along the way. And one of the ones that was so striking, of course, was the water ceremony, because we had already heard about just how poisoned everything was. And so this prayer was to bring back the water, to heal the water, so that they could continue their way of life. Um, this is Crystal with her little daughter, who can now no longer drink out of the rivers, like they were doing up until as little as 10 years ago, eight years ago, they would go on their traditional hunts and they would just ladle into the rivers because remember where they are. This is the most pristine and intact ecosystem left on our planet, way up in northern Canada. And they could still drink from the rivers and now they cannot drink from the rivers. And when they pull the fish from the rivers, the fish have tumors on them. And so this was a moment to pray for the water, to pray for the industry to clean up their act and to stop their destruction. Um, you know, Crystal tells a really powerful story of her um, pipe smoke, uh, the pipe ceremony when they signed the treaty four generations ago with the Canadian government. And what that meant to them when, it me when they said, you will forever be able to fish and hunt and gather your traditional medicines on this land. That's what the treaty says. The treaty says that this is your land. We will not touch it. It is yours forever in time. And now there are 20 of the world's biggest industries with leases throughout her territory and all those other First Nation territories with the rights to this land that is supposed to be their land. They show up to gather their medicine forage out of the land next to the riverbeds where they get some of their herbs that they have used for hundreds of generations to heal. And they're no longer there because the water is so poisoned, so many of the things no longer grow next to the river because they can't. So we stopped and we prayed that that would return. And of course, all the animals that are becoming sick from that would also be healed. So now we're just gonna run through some of the slides to show you what we experienced. So one of the things we, we noticed was, as I said, the air gets thicker and smellier um, and more toxic as we walked towards it. Um, they do have some very minute preserves or places that they've reclaimed. Um, one of them was bison and they give the First Nations people, they said that we'll, we'll let you traditionally hunt one bison a year or something. Um, but they're, it's full of toxic, and so they sent it off for a tox screen. Um, I noticed these greenways, they're starting to, to learn from the logging companies. It used to be, they were so such pride, this sandy area, which is basically dead, um, came all the way up to the road. Now they're growing these green spaces so that ultimately you won't be able to see it. They're really starting to worry about eco-terrorism -ter up there. Um, so the air just gets thicker, and you see more and more industry, the refineries. Um, did you want to say anything more about the refineries or the processing? Uh, I, I want to say this. Uh, sort of the, the, the flip side of extreme oil, extreme fossil fuels, is the assault on water. But out here, the Athabasca watershed, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's the third, I think, biggest uh, wetlands in the world. And these industries, again, the biggest industrial complex to be found on the globe right now are these, because this, this is just one, you know? You're gonna see a picture of a tailing pond in a bit, and you look over the horizon and there's another uh, cracking tower where the steam is rising off. There are multiple refineries up here. Uh, but they use several barrels of water for every barrel of oil they get out. 
And these, this is for the open pit mining, the water use for the, uh, for the in situ, the injection mining is even more intensive, four or five barrels of water for every barrel of oil they get. And the water is, it's not very usable afterwards. Um, and and the, the First Nations people are beginning to notice, you know, their wetlands drying as well as uh, being poisoned. So just showing you some of what we walked by. And I'd like to stop here for a moment. Go ahead. Oh, want you talk about the tailing? This, this really gets me. This is the second of two tailing ponds we hit. Uh, this is the sound of going on? These, these are... These are other refineries, because the one we were coming from is off this way. Both this tailing pond and the other one, this one has these sort of uh, tar sand scarecrows to ward off wildlife, principally flying wildlife. You, you walk past this, and every few seconds, boom, boom, like that. The cannons are going off, again, to ward them off. Because the birds, when they land, essentially drown in this stuff. There's a surface layer of, of what looks like water. It's kind of bitumen-laden water. And then just underneath it is this slurry of clay particles, minute particles, that it is so fine that it doesn't settle out. It just stays there and stays there for years. And then in the very lowest layer of these tailing ponds is actual quartz crystal sand that is settled out. Uh, so they're finding ways of kind of speeding up the process of, of getting rid of the tailing ponds. Uh, they sounded fairly unsavory to me when I read about them. Uh, but needless to say, these are vast. These things get filled at the rate of a, a Toronto sky dome full of water every day. And there are a whole bunch of them. You can see them from space. Uh, it's one. Uh, and, and they're fenced. You don't go near them. That fencing uh, is serious stuff. Well, early, earlier you saw one of those slides that talked a little bit about the surge of population and some of them being workers from away. It was very startling to me, both on the plane ride out and the plane ride back. I've never got on a 747 or whatever we got on where I was um, one of five women on the plane because it was all workers flying there to work more or returning home. They have these crazy shifts, this crazy working um, contract. Uh, on the way back, I sat next to a young Polish man, which was exciting for me because my na maiden name is Kasperzak, so I was psyched to be sitting next to a... Um, so anyway, as we were talking, he was explaining to me that he was here on contract with 40 other men from Poland because in Poland, he makes the equivalent of $5 an hour or something. Um, and here, he's making upwards of $60 an hour to work here. And his contract is that he works 28 days. I think he gets one every seventh day off, but he works for 28 days, and then he has four or five days off, and then he goes back and does the same thing again for... A, for three months, and then he'll have three weeks off. So he usually goes home every three months for a, a little window and then goes back and has that same schedule. And for those people, they live here. So this is their life for that chunk of time where they're breathing in and being exposed to this level of toxicity day and night on the dream of that they're going home to a place where they don't have these opportunities. And that was, for me as an activist, you know, a really important moment. You know, I'm on this plane and I'm really angry after seeing everything that I just saw. And then to sit next to a man who's coming from an area uh, who doesn't have a lot of opportunity and he gets handed this opportunity in, to bring home and save a bunch of money like Lee spoke to, um, what an opportunity, right? 
And so that's another piece that we're up against when you talk about the economic prosperity that's going on there. Um, they bring in people from all over the globe. And eventually you get sick of it. Like this man was not planning on doing this forever. But he certainly was going to do it for two or three years and develop a little nest egg for himself. And that's um, what the industry is so clever, right? They just keep moving from place to place and finding folks that are looking for um, this opportunity and they welcome them there and I have no doubt that um, 10 years from now he and his friends will probably be ill. Um, this is the thing you never do right on a PowerPoint. This is my slide. Hillary made the rest. Um, <laughs> like way too much text but the, <laughs> the reason I did this and you can look at it later but it's such startling information and what we're up against with the federal government there, the Harper's government. Okay, in its two omnibus bills, C-38 and C-45, the Harper government made drastic changes, this was like three years ago, to ch freshwater protection in Canada. It gutted the Fisheries Act, the most powerful tool they had to protect their water. The new laws no longer protect habitat, and it's limited to serious harm and only to fish that are used for commercial recreation and aboriginal purposes. So not only do you have to prove that you're causing serious harm, whatever that may be defined in the federal courts, but who cares if you're harming some salamander or some wetlands? It only, you have to prove harm only to fish that have economic value. Um, it killed the Navigable Waters Protection Act, stripping protection from 99% of the lakes and rivers in Canada. When they told us this story when we were up there, Crystal Lehman of the Beaver Lake Cree said, I went to bed and I woke up and the next day we had absolutely no way to protect the waters and the rivers in my backyard. Um, major pipelines and interprovincial power lines now have basically the green light to go over 31,000, 2.25 million rivers are no longer classified for federal scrutiny. By eliminating the Hazardous Material Information Review Commission, the Harper government has given the green light for companies to dump these chemicals into waterways and not having to disclose what's in the, wa in the contents. Sounds like our fracking laws. <laughs> um, this is just to, to show that they say that they will be reclaiming the areas for wildlife, um, but it's 0.16 percent. Yes. <laughs> it's very, very little has been reclaimed. How's that? Um, <laughs> and what I was told by somebody who lives in Fort McMurray is that there are a lot, the biodiversity is much reduced in these reclamation areas, and especially like uh, the medicinal plants are having a hard time coming back. Uh, this is also um, reclamation in progress. Uh, this is the, what, the reason why this is the fifth and last healing walk is that the First Nations see the need now to focus on all the frontline communities, all the people that are being impacted by extreme oil, um, extreme fossil fuels. But this, this is a Latino group that live uh, in Houston near in a community that is basically around the largest uh, cluster of refineries in the world. Uh, and they've been fighting the, the local pollution there and can't got to come up here. May and crowd for uh, MEJAC, the Mobile Environmental Justice Action Coalition, I think that's it. Uh, they, they noticed a pipeline kind of being put right through their school playground that uh, was kind of linking with a railroad terminal owned by, uh, I, I don't think it was trans it was the other, Enbridge. Enbridge owns the, owns the line. So taking by rail uh, the tar sands oil down into Mobile. And basically this is a, uh, an Afro-American community without a lot of political clout that the local authorities cooperating with the big corporations were just sort of, you know, assuming we can, we can do this. And they, they're a group that kind of got their neighborhoods together and, and stood up. They were so honored and pleased and deeply moved to, to be up seeing, you know, to link with, uh, with the First Nations people and, and see what was going on. 
So I put this in, White Mountains, because um, this is what I think about. What if it was our land? What if this is where we lived? Um, and I have to say that it is. I mean, we're all on one earth. But this is what the White Mountains could look like if we found this. The, um, the area for the, uh, the tar sands in Alberta is the size of most of New England if they chose to extract all the tar sands there. So this could be all of our lands. Um, it's starting to happen in Kentucky and Utah, so we do have it here in the US. And so then the next question is, where do we go from here? So this is, this is the happy part. I'm going to let Sarah talk about um, what's happened in South Portland. But this is the People's Climate March, where 400,000 people marched, which was just an amazing, I don't know how many people here were there, but to feel to, that mass of humanity. And, um, and instead of feeling the weight of all we have to do, we got to feel the joy of all of us working together. Um, so there are so many ways that, that we can, can work towards um, bringing justice to um, the First Nations people and to all beings. Uh, so one of the things that I do is work for land conservation um, with my local land trust. Um, my town is doing wonderful things where we're allocating town money to um, to weatherize our town buildings, to bring in solar, um, solar voltaics, to change how we heat our buildings. We, um, it's a little bit controversial, but we have our first pellet boiler for one of our municipal buildings. Um, so there are lots of ways that we can be working towards trying to find solutions. And I know that my friends here are going to come up with others, and I would keep going also. So just quickly, I know uh, a lot of you are probably familiar with what just took place down in South Portland, but uh, again, solutions-based uh, think global, act local uh, really matters and really can make an enormous difference down in South Portland. It was a sleepy community that wasn't necessarily full of a lot of activists and certainly not a lot of people that was were thinking about what's going on up in Alberta and tar sands extraction and what it meant from a climate change perspective and also from an environmental justice perspective. But as soon as that community woke up to those realities and the reality that they would suddenly um, become yet another frontline community to tar sands and learned a lot about the pollutions that would be coming out of the smokestacks that would have to be built there if that pipeline was reversed, they became very quickly mobilized and focused on what can we do at the local level to stop this. And they learned that they actually had a huge opportunity to put in an ordinance in place because of the air quality. Um, South Portland already gets a C for a grade from the American Lung Association. So it was very easy to compel the city council as well as the people to recognize that we don't need to be putting benzene and other carcinogens into the air from these smokestacks to have that grade go further south. Um, so in the effort of time and knowing that we're at minute 54 and we want some questions and answers, I'm going to stop there and we can add to it. But do you have any? Let's stop there. And see if there's any. Okay. So. Da -da -da.